Hello, welcome to week three. This is Kelly, your instructor. Um, we're going to go over the concepts of comfort, uh, including pain, acute and chronic, fatigue, fibromyalgia, and sleep disorders. This is the agenda. Uh, you can't see really the bottom, but um, I'll have you take a look here. All right, let's move on to pain. So pain is associated with actual or potential tissue damage is uh, whatever the patient says. So it's subjective. Remember that, not objective. Um, plays a protective role, warning of problems, and it's the fifth vital sign. As acute pain has a sudden onset. Uh, um, usually you can identify where the pain is. Um, short duration within or a few minutes to like six months. And there's three categories. Uh, somatic pain is a type of pain that originates from the musculoskeletal system. Includes the skin, muscles, bones, joints, and connective tissue. <coughs> mm. Excuse me. It is often described as sharp, localized, or well-defined pain, and typically easier for individuals to pinpoint and describe. Somatic pain is usually the result of an injury or damage to the somatic structures, and is often felt at or near the site of the injury. And then we have visceral pain. That refers to pain that originates from the internal organs, such as the heart, lungs, stomach, liver, or intestines. It is often described as a deep, dull, or aching pain that is less well-defined and can be challenging for individuals to localize or describe precisely. Visceral pain occurs when the internal organs stretch the distension or there's an inflammatory process being triggered uh, within or near the organs. And then we have referred pain. The referred pain is a phenomenon uh, where pain is felt in an area of the body that is different from the actual source or the site of pain. This occurs because the nerves that transmit pain signal pain signals from the different part of the body may converge or share pathways with the spinal cord or excuse me let me go back scratch that uh, this occurs because the nerves that transmit pain signals from different parts of the body may converge or share pathways in the spinal cord leading to the brain interpreting the pain as coming from a different area a classic example of referred pain is pain felt in the left arm during a heart attack. Even though the heart is the actual source of the pain, this happens because the heart and the left arm share nerve pathways. Chronic pain, on the other hand, lasts over six months and could be forever. Uh, it's not always known what the cause is, um, and it can range from mild to severe. And there are three categories of this. Chronically occurring pain refers to pain, or refers to the type of persistent pain that comes and goes over time with recurring episodes of pain. <clears throat> These pain episodes may be separated by periods of relief or less severe discomfort, but they tend to reoccur periodically. An example of chronic reoccurring pain is migraine headaches, where individuals experience intermittent severe headaches separated by headache-free intervals. Then we have chronic intractable benign pain. Chronic intractable benign pain describes long-lasting pain that is constant or near constant and doesn't respond well to treatment, but is not caused by a life-threatening condition. While the pain may be severe and persistent, it is not associated with a malignant or terminal illness. An example would be uh, conditions in, 
or that include uh, certain types of chronic low back pain or neuropathic pain syndromes and chronic progressive pain. Um, this is characterized by pain that worsens over time and is often associated with progressive underlying condition. This type of pain tends to become more severe or frequent as underlying disease disorders advance. Conditions like osteoarthritis, which will be way down the road that we'll discuss, certain types of cancer, week 10, and neurodegenerative diseases can lead to chronic progressive pain. Breakthrough pain is uh, transient exacerbation. Remember, exacerbation means uh, happens quickly. Of pain that occurs spontaneous or in relation to specific predictions or unpredictable triggers. There are three types. Incident pain <clears throat> refers to pain that is, occurs in response to specific incident or triggers. It is often localized in a particular area and is typically short-lived. An example of incident pain is the sharp, immediate pain experienced when pressing on a bruise or touching a wound. Idiopathic pain is a pain that has no identifiable or known cause. It is a type of pain that occurs spontaneously, persists without a clear explanation or underlying medical condition. And medical professionals may use this term idiopathic when they are unable to determine the origin, the origin or the cause of pain. Then you have the end of dose pain. This refers, also known as breakthrough pain, um, is a type of pain that occurs as a medication or pain relief treatment wears off. It is often associated with chronic conditions that can be challenging to manage effectively. Patients may experience a sudden increase in pain intensity towards the end of their prescribed dosing interval requiring additional rescue medication to alleviate the pain. And we have central pain. Um, this is caused by a stroke, multiple sclerosis, Parkinson's disease, or trauma, all of which we'll be discussing in a later week, uh, may occur immediately or delayed, as often described as burning, pins and needles, aching, or lacerations and may be less able to feel normal touch, sort of like um, neuropathy. <clears throat> Phantom pain is felt um, in an amputated limb or body part, or where it should be, described as shooting, stabbing, squeezing, throbbing, or burning. Expected assessment findings, um, you would find an elevated blood pressure and pulse so that would be objective. Nausea and vomiting, also objective. Sweating, rapid shallow breathing, decreased functions and activities of daily living. Now, psychological effects um, include depression, social withdrawal, and fatigue, which we're gonna talk about in more depth here pretty quick. And we have uncontrolled pain, can lead to atrophy or neuropathies, where you have numbness and tingling and can't really feel <clears throat> alterations in pulmonary, digestive, and mobility areas. Um, changes in appetite, sleep dis disruptions, decreased CO2, and more risk of thrombosis because you're not moving around. Uh, pain management. Um, requires a collaborative team to manage um, pharmacological therapies and non-pharmacological therapies. So the World Health Organization has a three-step analgesic ladder. The first step, mild pain, use aspirin, ibuprofen, or anything like over-the-counter. Uh, moderate pain, step two, use mild opiate, such as codeine, and step three, um, use something stronger like morphine. 
and this is outlined here, zero to four pain, use a non-opiate analgesic, um, so Tylenol, aspirin, ibuprofen, Tordal, or Celebrex. Mild um, opiate, like Vicodin, and then step three, stronger opiate, opiate like morphine, hydrocodone, or hydromoform, which is Dilaudid, Oxycontin, and fentanyl. A few opiate side effects include constipation, nausea, itching, and then you can develop a tolerance or addiction to this. Some nursing implications include um, watching for drug-to-drug -drug interactions and duplication of meds. Uh, for opiates, uh, monitor sedation and respiratory depression the first 24 hours uh, during the peak effect. After changes of dose, and when changing the type of the route. So if you're going from IV to oral, or oral to IV, IV works a lot quicker. You wanna watch that. And for respiratory rates under eight breaths per minute, you wanna think about Narcan therapy that immediately blocks opiates. Some non-pharmacological therapies include invasive therapies, uh, like a nerve block, injection of local anesthetic into the nerves to temporarily block nerve activity, permanent nerve blocks, or surgery. Non-invasive include acupuncture. Herbal supplements apparently work. Um, electric, electronic health, mobile health applications. And medical marijuana were legal in the states, some of the states, but not federally. All right, fatigue. Let's talk about fatigue. Basically, it's a lack of energy and motivation. I think we all kind of know that. Acute fatigue um, is just kind of normal tiredness. Chronic fatigue lasts longer and is more intense, commonly caused by long-term illness or medications. And chronic fatigue syndrome uh, last, that lasts greater than six months accompanied by joint or muscle pain, headaches, sleep and memory problems. A few physical symptoms include you know, lethargy, muscle weakness, palpitations, and you could read the rest. Uh, some neurological symptoms, uh, confusion, slow reflexes, impaired coordination, sleep disturbance and depression. Like phys fatigue syndrome, I think we've already talked about that. It, you know, severe tiredness lasting longer than six months, not caused by primary condition, not relieved by stress reduction, and not feeling rested after adequate sleep. And then get a few more here. Uh, let's talk about the nursing process, and we'll probably focus more on that in upcoming uh, slides. So we've got the assessment, observe, um, and interview the patient for fatigue syndrome or symptoms, do a health history, um, including duration, timing, and quality of fatigue impact on activities of daily living, um, whatever medications they're taking, and what those cognitive effects are. A physical examination, including vital signs, uh, mobility, hydration, muscle strength, fever, etc. A few nursing diagnoses uh, could be insomnia, sleep deprivation, fatigue, inability to tolerate activity, self neglect, because you're too tired to work on yourself. Poor coping skills and stress overload. And in planning, the patient ideally would verbalize understanding and practice of good sleep hygiene. Uh, verbalize increased energy, and these also could be goals. Um, 
indicates increased activity for ADLs. Uh, the patient participates in mild exercise program. The patient explains the relationship of fatigue to a disease process and activity level and incorporates patient's goals and preferences into the plan of patient care. Implementation, I always want to consider cultural and developmental needs. Um, patient teaching, uh, structured activities uh, to align with the patient's peak energy levels, assisting with self-care activities, enhancing coping for patients with chronic conditions, and evaluation. Um, you want to evaluate whether the, the fatigue is getting better or worse, assess if medical and nursing interventions are effective, consider both subjective, what the patient says, and objective, what we see, the data, uh, modify therapy if interventions are not working, and consider additional diagnostic tests if needed. So fibromyalgia, for an overview, please read 221 to 223. We don't need to go over the pathophysiology and all that. So just be sure you read that before class. The nursing process includes uh, patient history, assess the family history for fibromyalgia or other rheumatic, rheumatic diseases, do a physical, physical assessment, including current comorbid conditions and physical fitness. A few nursing diagnoses are listed here. Um, insomnia, fatigue, chronic pain, uh, lack of knowledge about fibromyalgia. Some planning, uh, the patient reports decreased pain, um, fewer sleep disturbances, improved activity tolerance, and symptom severity scale score less than five. And that should be in your book somewhere. Limitation. Um, so pain management interventions, um, educate on medication use, uh, non-pharmacological uh, reduction methods could be massage, exercise, distraction, family support, environmental modifications. And a few fatigue um, reduction interventions could include um, encouraging enjoyable but quiet activities, pacing activities, and good sleep hygiene. Also inc increasing activity tolerance with these items here. And evaluation, uh, the patient reduces pain su sufficiently for activity and sleep, expresses feelings related to a chronic condition, obtain adequate follow-up, and avoids narcotics and addictive substances to prevent addiction. And next is sleep disorders. Please read 225 to 234 for a sleep disorder um, overview. For the nursing process, we have a few things here. Assessment. Um, oh, you're going to observe for signs of fatigue, cognitive impairment, or irritability. Uh, spouses or patients, actually, let me go back. Spouses or parents may provide helpful information about sleep habits, especially if they're sleeping with them. Interview and sleep history includes trouble falling asleep, frequency of waking up at night, morning feelings, how you, how you feeling in the morning, um, normal sleep schedule, sleep related behaviors like snoring or sleepwalking, daytime drowsiness, bedwetting, mostly in children, um, morning headaches, sleep habits affecting relationship, work, school, and other activities, 
use of caffeine, alcohol, or tobacco, recent changes in sleep patterns, and coping methods for sleep problems. So you can use the Epworth sleepiness scale, physical examination, including fatigue and possible sleep disorder, and the polysonography for suspected sleep disorder. And I believe that's the same thing as sleep study. Nursing diagnosis um, includes all of these, and I'll give you a minute to read those. Planning, um, the idea or the goal would be to sleep through the night, use relaxation techniques before bed, and then some of these other ones, uh, spouse reports decreased snoring, and no abnic episodes, as in with sleep apnea. Implementation. Educate the patient about the factors affecting sleep patterns. Um, instruct on proper use of assistive devices like BiPAP or CPAP. <coughs> Teach about prescribed medications, side effects, and interactions, you know, sleep medications like Ambien, uh, melatonin, etc. Educate on the principles of good sleep hygiene. And evaluation. Try to collect data on sleep quality and duration and how the patient feels upon awakening through and throughout the day. Reassess. If outcomes are not achieved, consider ideologic factors and changes in medic medical condition or medications, adherence to sleep hygiene, and avoidance of daytime napping, and effectiveness of therapies. And it looks like that's it. So do all of your reading. Uh, watch this video prior to class, and we'll do some case studies and relating this to other topics. All right, I'll see you later.